Good morning. Good morning. And it is a good morning, even though it is the worst day of the year. Well, I think it is anyway, but you managed to get up maybe with no problems at all. It was a struggle for some of the rest of us. But it is a good day because God meets us here in his house and he fills us with all kinds of gifts and blessings, not the least of which is his body and blood. Uh, so we thank the Lord for the gifts that he gives us and we gather here now to receive those gifts and to give him thanks for them. Before our service begins, let's uh, go through a couple of announcements. Uh, first of all, last Monday's Voters Assembly uh, decided a couple of things that are worth mentioning. Uh, one of them is in the bulletin. You can see that there is an, an announcement in there about an Easter breakfast. Uh, after each of the services on Easter Sunday, we will have a breakfast served by the church council. We are asking folks to sign up for that only so that we have an idea of how much food to make. Um, I'm sure we'll have extras in case someone doesn't sign up and decides to show up. Um, but if you don't mind putting your name or even just putting an X on that paper to, to demonstrate that you're interested in coming, that gives us some idea how much food to prepare. And then speaking of Easter Sunday, another thing that was decided at that meeting was that our nine o'clock service on Easter Sunday will be a masked service, just like we do now at our 1030 services on Easter, sun, uh, Easter sunrise service will be normal, uh, but our 9 a.m. service will be a masked service. So everyone coming to the nine o'clock service on Easter Sunday uh, will be expected to have masks on uh, throughout the service. A uh, couple other quick announcements. There is an interesting movie coming out that's called Church People, um, and it's free for churches to show to their congregations. Uh, I put something on our Facebook page about that to see who might be interested in coming. Uh, it's middle of March until middle of April. We can uh, stream it freely, and I thought if people wanted to, we could put that in our, in our fellowship hall. People could kind of come together and sit still six feet apart and all of that, but, but uh, be an opportunity to get together and, and do something together as a church family if people are interested and ready for that. So um, if you're interested, let me know. And then finally, today's radio broadcast is being sponsored by Scott and Yvette Rajeski in the memory of Lois Rajeski. And so we wanted to take a moment to thank them for making today's service possible for those who can't be here in person. With those announcements being said, let's go ahead and begin our worship for today. Singing our opening hymn, We Sing the Praise of Him Who Died. May God bless our worship.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake God forgives you all your sins. Therefore, as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The intro for today is taken from Psalm 107. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Whom he has redeemed from trouble. And gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west. From the north and from the south. Some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to a city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble. And he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way. Till they reached the city to dwell in. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love. For his wondrous works to the children of man. For he satisfies the longing soul. And the hungry soul he fills with good things. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. We continue now at the Kyrie. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. During the season of Lent, we omit the hymn of praise, so we continue now with the salutation and collect. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, your mercies are new every morning, and although we have in no way deserved your goodness, you still abundantly provide for all our wants of body and soul. Give us, we pray, your Holy Spirit, that we may heartily acknowledge your merciful goodness toward us, give thanks for all your benefits, and serve you in willing obedience. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. The Old Testament reading for today comes from the book of Numbers, chapter 21. From Mount Hor, they, the Israelites, after leaving slavery in Egypt, set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. 
And the people spoke against God and against Moses, saying, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many of the people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle reading for today comes from Paul's letter to the Christians in Ephesus, chapter 2. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were, by nature, children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places, in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is the word of the Lord. Let us now rise out of reverence for the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the third chapter. Jesus said, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. This is the Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. We continue now with the hymn of the day, Jesus, Refuge of the Weary.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Heavenly Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. An American couple took a trip to Ireland to celebrate their 20th anniversary. As they were sitting in a pub, they looked over at the table next to them and saw Bono. Now, for those of you who are not aware of who Bono is, he is a world-famous singer-songwriter for the most popular band in the world, at least according to some, a gr an Irish band called U2. And there he was, this most famous guy in the world, sitting right there next to him, having lunch with some other guy. The couple was so overwhelmed at seeing this musical superstar that they couldn't even eat. They just sat there and stared. When Bono finally got up to use the restroom, the couple rushed over to his table and asked his friend if he thought Bono would mind if they said hello and took a couple of pictures. The friend said Bono would be happy to do it. So when Bono came back, his friend took the couple's camera and snapped a few photos of them with Bono. When they were done, they thanked Bono for being so gracious, and then they went back to their own table. Soon Bono and his friend got up and finished their meal and left. Not long after that, the couple finished their own meal and called the waitress over to pay for their bill. The waitress told them that it wasn't necessary because someone had already paid the bill for them. It was the person sitting at the table next to them. Shocked and amazed, they looked at the waitress and said, Are you kidding? Bono paid for our lunch? And the waitress smiled and said, No, it was the other guy. Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> Can you imagine being an American that didn't recognize Bruce Springsteen when you saw him? Well, that would be like a Pharisee, knowing all of the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah and yet not recognizing him when he was standing right there in front of them. That is what happened to a man named Nicodemus. He knew all the signs that, that the Messiah would do when he arrived. The deaf would hear, the blind would see, the lame would walk, even the death, dead would be raised from the death. Dead, <laughs> sorry. And when Nicodemus met Jesus, he said, Rabbi, we know that you are from God, for no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with him. So Nicodemus knew that Jesus was from God. And yet he still didn't recognize who Jesus truly was. Kind of reminds me of a video that I once saw where a miracle happened right in front of the eyes of everybody. And still people didn't believe it. The video was of a car that had been engulfed in rapidly rising floodwaters. People rushed out to the car to try to rescue the woman who was trapped inside. But the windows were all closed and nobody could break through them in order to get the woman out. As the rescuers stood on the roof of the car, which was now completely submerged underwater, they reached frantically down into the water, desperately trying to find a way to rescue this woman. Suddenly, one of them felt a hand and he pulled. And it was the woman and he pulled her out of the car, out of the water to safety. When the waters went down and the car was finally recovered, people noticed something strange about the car. The windows, all of them, were still up. So what happened? I would call that a miracle. A sign that God's mercy had visited that situation. But the experts had a different explanation. They said that the water in the car must have messed with the electrical system and that made the windows go down and then later on go up again. I thought to myself, and maybe you might think the same thing, okay, the next time one of these cars goes into a lake around here, let's just see if the windows suddenly start going up and down. Probably not. Now, of course, I don't know if God was actually involved or not. But a miracle like that certainly would be one of the signs you'd expect to see if he was. Likewise, the Old Testament scriptures declared that when Messiah arrived, he would do all kinds of amazing and mighty things. And he did. In fact, Nicodemus had even seen them. But in the end, doing those things was not our Lord's purpose for coming. 
In perhaps the most famous Bible verse of all, Jesus told Nicodemus why he had come. He said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now, if you want to fully appreciate what Jesus was saying here, you should know that in John's Gospel, every time or almost every time he uses the word cosmon, which is world, it's in a negative, ungodly sense. In other words, when John uses the word world, it's almost always a bad thing. So when Jesus said that God so loved the world, he was acknowledging that the world did not deserve God's love because of the fact that it was wicked and lost. Jesus made that point even more clear when he continued by saying, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Do you know why Jesus wasn't sent to condemn the world? It's because the world already stood condemned. Every inhabitant of the earth was already guilty and deserved God's punishment, which was eternal death. But Jesus had not come to just stand on the high ground and point to the drowning sinner and tell her that she was in trouble. He had come to grab her by the hand and rescue her from the deluge of sin and death that threatened to swallow her up forever. When Jesus came to the earth, it was already enslaved to sin and obligated to suffer the punishment that God's law required. He didn't need to condemn it because it was already condemned. Now, it's true that when our Lord returns, he will render final judgment on the world and unbelieving sinners will be condemned. But that wasn't his purpose 2,000 years ago. Back then, he came to rescue the world from their sins and to restore them to a right relationship with God. In order to do that, Jesus had to take our place and suffer all the penalties that our sins deserved, which the law required. That gospel message was summed up pretty well in that famous verse, John 3.16, that you heard me read earlier. But you know, there's quite a few other wonderful gospel messages in the other readings for today, too which also can serve to remind us of God's great and undeserved love for us. For example, in today's Old Testament reading, God punished the wicked and rebellious Israelites by sending deadly serpents into their camp. But after they cried out for help, God had mercy on them. And since serpents were the problem, God provided them with a different serpent, a bronze one, lifted up on a pole, to be the source of their salvation. About 1,300 years later, he did a similar thing for mankind. But this time, since the problem was mankind, God sent a man to be their savior. As Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. That's talking about us. And although we didn't deserve to be rescued from sin, death, or the devil, God did it anyway, because he loves us. That message is clearly stated in today's epistle reading. There, Paul declared that man is dead in sin, a follower of the devil, and obedient only to his own sinful flesh. That moved Paul to write, we were by nature children of wrath. Yet even then, God loved us and made us alive in Christ. These are powerful reminders of the kind of love that God has for us. And we need them. Because in this world, people break their promises to us all the time. Relationships that we never expected to end do because the world is fallen and corrupt. And no matter how good people might want to be, all of us have been affected by this world's wickedness and infected by Adam's sin. And that's why we need to know that God's love for us is trustworthy. 
It isn't based on feelings that can change or fade. It's based on a covenant promise that he made to us. In the Old Testament, God did not abandon Israel, even when they rejected him, because of the covenant promise he had made to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And he doesn't abandon us either, because of the covenant promise that he made to us in the body and blood of his son, Jesus Christ, which we received at our baptisms. Covenants are not like contracts. When it comes to contracts, if one party fails to keep their end of the bargain, the other party can back out. But that's not how it works with God's covenants. He offers freely to give and to do all kinds of things for his people, regardless of whether they deserve it or not. Now, we can certainly reject those gifts, but God won't withhold them from us even when we failed to deserve them. That's because this promise has never been contingent on our faithfulness. As Paul wrote in his second letter to Timothy, God is faithful even when we are not, for he cannot deny himself. In other words, even if God wanted to turn his back on us, he can't. His own oath and promise obligates him to forgive us and save us. Not for our sakes, but for his own name's sake and for the sake of Jesus, who redeemed us by paying our debt in full. And he did that for us even before we knew we needed it. And he had to do it because there was nothing that we could do. After all, we were the ones who sinned against him. Now hopefully by now you know that the only one who has the power to mend a broken relationship is the one who was wronged. The person who did the damage, there's no amount of apologies or peace offerings that they can offer that can fix things. Nope. The only one who can do that is the one who is harmed. When they are willing to offer forgiveness, that's when they fix what the other person broke. And that's how it is with God and us. No matter what we do, we can't undo the damage that our sins have done. But God can. And he did. By sending his son to fulfill the law in our place so that we could receive forgiveness, righteousness, and life. Through the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ, God has done it. He has so loved the world that he kept his ancient promise. And our Lord has given us the proof we need to believe it. In one unmistakable sign, it's the sign of his son being lifted up on a wooden pole and hanging there until he died. Of all the signs that God ever did, that was the sign that fully revealed the Father's love for us. That was the sign that saved us. And we still look to that sign today for hope, life, and salvation. Even after seeing that sign, there are still many people in our world today who, like Nicodemus, refuse to believe it. Perhaps to them it seems too good to be true. They might wonder, all we have to do is just believe God's word? Why would God make it so easy for us to be saved, especially when we don't deserve it? My dear friends in Christ, hopefully you know why God did it. It's because he's rich in mercy. And because that's how much he loved the world. That's how much he loves you. Despite all your sins and rebellious wickedness, what he's always wanted most was to spend eternity with you. So he made it happen. And then he gave you a sign as the proof that he had done it. May you always look to his sign and see it as the proof of his love and believe it now and forevermore. Amen.
At this time, I invite you to rise and join with me in confessing our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. We confess together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing the offertory as our offerings are now brought forward. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for revealing your love to us by sending your Son to be our salvation. Knowing that we have not deserved your gifts of grace, help us to be moved by your goodness so that we would eagerly receive your promised blessings and strive to love you back by obeying all your commandments. Gracious Lord, because you've promised to be our refuge and strength and an ever-present help in the day of trouble, we come to you today to pray for all who cry out to you in their times of need, especially Beth, Elizabeth, Ruth, Belwyn, Amy, Michelle, Stephen, Trevor, Rebecca, Melody, Rosemary, Heather, Madeline, Giselle, Linda, Roger, Peggy, Kellen, Sarah, Orlin, Denny, Darlene, Mary, Jim, Tom, and Jack. Holy Spirit, we give you thanks that you have united yourself to us through the waters of baptism and bestowed on us your gifts of faith, grace, forgiveness, and life. We especially rejoice with those who celebrate their baptismal birthdays this week, including Judy, Sophia, Wade, Karen, Shalea, Mariah, and Stacy. May they and all of us continually live and rejoice in all the blessings you bestowed on us that day when you adopted us to be your own beloved children. Almighty God, you rule the whole universe and everything in it is under your loving care. Therefore, we ask you to bring uh, the harm and the fear that this virus has caused to a speedy end, to help those who are struggling financially, to heal those who have been harmed by physical or emotional violence, to have mercy on those who have been devastated by natural disasters, to bless those in prisons and orphanages, and to sustain those who risk their lives for the good of their neighbors. May you work good in all things and give to your people those things that you know we need. Finally, Lord, we ask you to bless, guide, and keep the leaders of your church on earth, including Matt, our synodical president, Don, our district president, Don, our circuit visitor, and all the leaders of St. Mark's who serve us here in a variety of ways. We thank and praise you for stirring up these faithful servants among us and for all that you do for us through them. May your spirit rest upon them and work through them so that they may be enabled to continue serving this congregation faithfully and to help us all carry out the ministries of our church. All these things and whatever else may be on our hearts and minds today, we lift all of it up to you in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. We continue now at the service of the sacrament. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let
let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God. You bid your people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast. Renew our zeal in faith and life and bring us to the fullness of grace that belongs to the children of God. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. And in the same way also after supper he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us now stand and join together in singing the post-communion canticle, Thank the Lord and Sing His Praise. pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you have given us a foretaste of the feast to come in the Holy Supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage, 
that on the day of his coming, we may, together with all your saints, celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give to you his peace. You may be seated for the singing of our closing hymn. 